The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash ZXF860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming for this symposium. We're going to talk about changing the paradigm of CMV management, the new science and more choices for challenging cases in the HCT setting. So it's going to be case-based kind of symposium and hopefully try to answer some more practical questions that most of you may have online when you are taking care of our transplant patient. My name is Roy Shimali. I'm an infectious disease specialist. I work at MD Anderson Cancer Center. I'm the director of the Clinical Virology Research Program. And with me is Dr. Zinia Papanikolaou. She is a professor of medicine at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York. And also she ran the clinical trials at Memorial Sloan Kettering. A little bit of background, probably preaching to the choir, but you all know how significant is CMV after transplant and how common it is after hematopoietic cell transplantation. The incidence could be probably on average around 30 to 40 percent, but depends on the risk group that we are targeting, we are looking at, but could be up to 80 percent, if not more, actually, in cord blood transplantation. And the end organ disease, I think over the past probably 20 years, we did a good job in trying to prevent CMV and organ disease. As you know, we're seeing much less pneumonitis or GI disease, but still, when it happened, it could be pretty significant to our patient. In auto, it's not common. Usually it's around 1% you see it, but an allotransplant could be sometime up to 30% if you're looking at the highest risk group and if you're not following patient either prophylactically or doing preemptive therapy from the get-go. And also this incidence could end up high, especially after maybe day 100, where patients are either lost of love or they don't come quite often to follow up with us and to get tested for CMV before they get end organ disease. So let's start with my case. First, a 65-year-old woman who has acute myeloid leukemia has high-risk cytogenetics. She underwent haploidentical transplant from her 23-year-old daughter. She has CMV seropositive, IgG positive, and she was conditioned with single dose of TBI, fludarabine, and cyclophosphamide, and she got POSI day 3 and 5. Engrafted by day 18 with engraftment syndrome. So she received short course of steroids but she was discharged home by day 30 on TACR. So the risk factor, so how we certify patients if they are at risk for CMV infection, especially early on. So early on, we look at the baseline characteristics. First, you look at recipient seropositivity because we know from earlier data, from earlier and the recent data, especially from Michael Bock group from Fred Hodge, looking at only recipient positivity for CMV as a major risk factor for CMV reactivation. And you see this one in this study looking at either D plus or minus, where the risk could be up to 31 or 32 percent if you do the PCR molecular testing, or look at recipient positive per se, the risk is much higher and could be up to 76 percent having CMV reactivation and or disease after transplantation. So if you look at the single risk factor for CMV, CMV at the baseline and later on, it is a recipient seropositivity. But other risk factors also that we're going to try to cover is you stratify them usually at the time from transplantation. So if you look at early on within the 30 or 29, you look at type of transplant, you look at the source of the transplantation of the cells, and the type of the conditioning regimen, especially early on, but later on also can have an impact. Early on after transplant, usually we don't see much of CMV disease, pretty rare. We see more CMV reactivation, but these are the baseline characteristics. But what we need to keep in mind, and as you all know probably, that this is dynamic. This may change. So you start with the baseline characteristics. Patient could be at low risk for CMV reactivation, but after day 30 or around day 40, 50, if they get GVHD, grab versus host disease, now they are become at higher risk of CMV reactivation. 
So risk factor after day 30, you worry about grab versus host disease or delay of this cell recovery for many reasons. It could be because of the conditioning regimen or other reasons where you put patient at risk. So this, even if patients starting with low risk, they may become at high risk after day 30. You see here, you can see some CMV disease, but it's not as common as CMV reactivation. We start to worry more about 100 days after transplant when our patients are surviving longer and they may have lots of risk factors to develop CMV reactivation of the disease after the 100. So if we have patients who already have Graves versus host disease before the 100 and they've been treated with steroid, they have delayed in T-cell recovery or any CMV reactivation before the 100, they put them at risk of having CMV reactivation. But unfortunately, after the 100, they may get more CMV disease because of the close follow-up or observation of this patient or failing to go and get their blood tested for CMV on a weekly basis when they're supposed to, especially if they're doing fine, but they're still at risk for CMV. So they may come back to us with CMV disease, either pneumonitis or GI disease. So we worry about that now. We're becoming more cognizant of this kind of disease after the 100. So our patient, she was started on Letulmovir at 480 milligram once a day for CMV prophylaxis and at day plus five post the transplant. This is our internal protocol. We start uh, sooner in all patients who are recipient positive and 480 milligram, not 240 because patient not getting cyclosporin. If they were getting cyclosporin, then you go to half of the dose, 240 milligram once a day. At day plus 33 and routine surveillance, we still continue doing viral load measurement either once a weekly or twice a week. So we didn't stop this practice yet, even though patient going to be on prophylaxis with Leturmovir. So her CMV viral load by PCR was positive at 270 IU per ml. Recent ANC 850, ALC of 250 or absolute lymphocyte count. Patient completely asymptomatic, no fever, malaise or other symptoms. And this is very common scenario, probably, that you're seeing in your patient with or without Leturmovir. Usually without Leturmovir, you know, you're seeing this low level of reactivation. So my question to you, what would you do next? You stop Leturmovir and start preemptive therapy with oral Valgan or IV Gan Cyclovir. You continue Leturmovir and start preemptive therapy with either of these two drugs, you continue Leturmovir and repeat another CMV viral load, or you start preemptive therapy with Foscarnet because of low ANC. So this is a good question, actually. When we start using Leturmovir, we start to learn really what to do with this kind of scenarios. We were a little bit more jumpy initially that we used to stop Leturmovir and start treatment, any level of reactivation or higher. But we learned that, you know, most of the time, if you repeat the viral load after a few days, you may see negative, go back, or maybe it's still at the low level and they don't progress. So we're learning over the past two years, it's probably this is the best approach instead of stopping treating with toxic drug and then go back to Leturmovir or not. And the, all of the question, what are the thresholds to start therapy and high risk versus low risk? And if I ask hundreds of you here, each one of you from different institutions will have different answer. And this is a famous overview, how I treat CMV from Michael Bock and Per Lugman, looking at different institutions and different cutoff. As you see here, for high risk, at Fred Hodge, you can go with any level. At, in Sweden, Karolinska Institute at 1,000. And then when you go down on the risk, you have higher threshold in at least at Fred Hodge. And we have the same kind of approach at MD Anderson, but we use different cutoff, which is 500. So which one is the right cutoff? I don't think anyone knows. Could be higher, could be lower, but it depends where you perform. And the reason behind that is why we don't have established threshold. You have to be very careful. What kind of molecular testing are you doing? Are you following the WHO international standard? But even with that, what they found, nice study published recently showing there is still intervariability in the same lab and between lab. So if you take the same sample and run it a few times in the same lab, you may get different answer or viral load and between labs also, and could be up to four log differences in this. So this is, I think, it's an inherent problem with the testing that we have, and sometimes could be homegrown testing or molecular testing that we're doing versus commercialized assays. So that's probably one of the reasons why we don't have a good threshold to guide us all when to start treatment or not for preventive therapy. 
But we know preemptive therapy works. And when you institute it at, you know, whatever threshold you have in your institution, you're going to decrease the amount of or the incidence of CMV disease because this is the goal. Our objective is to have less and less CMV disease, which is harder to treat and is associated with higher mortality. Okay, so let's move on and talk a little bit about the new antiviral agent. I'm going to talk a little bit about Leturmovir, and uh, Zenia will talk about uh, mainly Maribavir, show some new published data. And I'm going to share also with you some new published data on Leturmovir, which work on the terminase complex of the CMV, PUL56 and 89, which will actually halt the DNA elongation and then the pro-capsid formation, or the capsid formation of the virus. That's how it inhibits CMV replication. Application. This is the phase two study that we did after transplant, looking at dose escalation from 60 up to 240, and you see 240 worked very nicely to decrease the amount of CMV infection or preemptive therapy in this patient compared to placebo. Then the phase three trial the landmark study looking at prevention of CMV in adults, CMV seropositive recipient after transplantation using the Turmovir versus placebo to to one randomization. And you see here where they get the study drug up to week 14. Then you follow the primary endpoint or outcome at week 24, looking at clinically significant CMV infection, the proportion of the one that were prevented versus placebo. And we continue to follow the patient up to week 48 looking at all cause mortality as well. And these are the characteristics of the patient, same kind of characteristic as you see here, a little bit more male than female. I'm not going to go over all details. You should be familiar by now of this data published in 2017 by Francisco Mari and all of us who were part of this trial. And this is also probably a pretty familiar slide looking at clinically significant CMV infection, placebo versus leturmovir, where you found the difference at week 14 as well as week 24, where we measured the primary outcome and they were slightly significant. But you see this uptake of clinically significant infection after you stop the drug. And when we look more closely into that, we found that this patient was still at risk after the 100 for CMV infection. And what we're doing now, we have another trial looking at extending prophylaxis up to the 100 because of that. So looking at high risk versus low risk, you see the same kind of impact on using the Turmovir, preventing significant infection when you compare to placebo. But I think the icing on the cake for us came when we looked at the all-cause mortality data, at least at week 24. It was an exploratory endpoint, and we found the difference between patient being on Leturmovir, having lower mortality, all-cause mortality versus the one on placebo. It loss is slightly significant, but numerically lower on week 48 as well. So a kind of signal telling us that preventing CMV from reactivating can have impact on the ultimate outcome, which is all-cause mortality. But this is another study also from the phase three trial looking at 70 patients who had already at randomization detectable CMV in the blood before they get randomized within the window of randomization. They got detectable and comparing Leturmovir to placebo. So what happened to this patient? They were continued on the trial and we looked at the outcome recently. And these are the characteristics of the patient as you see listed here. But what's interesting, when you look at the Leturmovir arm, still, at least at week 14, around 30% of this patient progress on Leturmovir, but around 90% on placebo progress to significant infection, and they require preemptive therapy. But if you look at the data at 24 weeks after we, the Leturmovir was stopped, this patient up to 52% progress and 87% on placebo. So there's still some differences in progress. So not all patients only half of them progress when they receive Leturmovir versus the placebo if you had positive DNA uh, randomization or at starting the treatment, the study drug. When you look at undetectable, so this is the rest of the cohort, this is where the efficacy analysis of the cohort showing the same kind of curve but much less on Leturmovir or the placebo, the patient who didn't have detectable DNA at randomization.
More interesting as well, what about all-cause mortality? Although small number of patients, 70 patients, but also we saw a signal if they were on Letermovir when they had detectable CMV DNA, they had lower mortality than placebo, as you see it here, even up to week 48, although it was not a significant small number, but you can see the signal as well. So if they got Letermovir, they had a little bit lower mortality than placebo versus the undetectable that you see here, which I showed you the result before. And this is also another way of looking at the whole trial, the three trial subject, where we're interested to see if all cause mortality through week 48 in patients who already have, while on Letermovir or placebo, had clinically significant CMV infection. And this is the first graph that you see here. So if they already have either breakthrough on the Turmovir versus placebo, uh, de novo reactivation or reactivation, they still had lower mortality. So even if they reactivated on the Turmovir, you have lower all cause mortality at week 24 or 48, as you see here when you compare to placebo, if they had clinically significant CMV infection. And when they don't have any significant infection during the trial period, they had the same all cause mortality between the two R. So what made a difference at the significant infection actually? as you see it here while on the trial. So this is an interesting concept for the past few years. We're talking about any viremia may have impact on all-cause mortality or non-relapse mortality. As you see here, one of the first studies from also Fred Hodge group, Michael Bock and Margaret Green, looking at negative CMV reactivation during the transplant. They had lower mortality. This is the blue line as you see it here versus any higher level of viral load or even any viral load, more than 150 versus more than 1,000 and non-relapse mortality the same trend. So I'm sure you heard about this concept, we've been talking about it. And next, so this was one single center, but not the CIBMTR data, which was published also kind of recently or a few years ago. They showed the same, so they had the same question. Is any level of viremia or any CMV viremia reactivation or the anemia can have impact on all-cause mortality after transplant? And they found it is true when you look at a patient with AML who got transplanted, ALL, CML, or MD and you see that risk of death is higher if they reactivated their CMV versus if they did not in this big database, CIBMTR database, which more than 9,400 patients were included in this analysis. So let's move on to our patient who was kept on Letermovir. Most of you, you know, had the same response uh, or same action where we kept it on Letermovir. We said, we learned enough not to stop it and to repeat the viral load and it came back less than 137. This is the minimal level of detection at our place. But later on, she has severe diarrhea at day plus 60. She had acute GVHD of the GI tract. She received high dose steroid. And plus 100, she did pretty well, resolved, and we had to stop the term of year because we couldn't continue after the 100. It's indicated up to the 100, and we couldn't get approval to continue this from their third-party payer. So what happened after that? So the patient may have this question to you. So what is the risk? How can you quantify the risk of this patient when you stop the prophylaxis or when they have already Graves host disease before the 100? What will be the incidence of CMV reactivation or the risk for CMV disease? Can we really quantify that? Do you think the risk is likely around 60% because she had GVHD? Or it's negligible because now she's off steroids? Or it's hard to tell because I don't have a specific test to look at the risk or none of the above. So let me show you some data on that. When you look at the risk after the 100, if they already are at high risk before the 100, it could be up to 20%. The patient may develop CMV activity or CMV disease, actually, in some of the studies they looked at. So it is not uncommon in this patient population unless you have good follow-up mechanism and let them check their CMV viral load. Now, is measuring T-cell production of interferon gamma to in response to CMV, is it helpful for us or not? I'm going to show some quick data on that. I think this is something you stay tuned. We're working on some kind of guidance or guidelines. When to use this kind of assay to help us determine patient at risk or not, or to predict or even to manage this patient. 
There is multiple assays. Unfortunately, there is only one available commercially. The rest is under investigation research or not available in the state, at least commercially, from either intracellular cytokine staining assay versus multimer staining or the ELISA testing versus ELI spot testing. And you have different company, different people have it here. And this is some advantage and limitation. I'm not going to go over it. I'm going to show you some data that we worked on, which is the ELI spot assay for CMV. And the way it works, you expose PBMCs to CMV peptide, and you see how much amount of gamma interferon is secreted, and you can spot it with the antibodies to interferon, and you get some spot, and you count the spot, can it make it positive or negative? And this is for IE1, intermediate early antigen, versus PP65. So this could be negative, and this is strongly positive, as you see here. So this is the way it works at the ELI spot platform. Dr. Francisco Mari showed the data this morning. It was published just today. Actually, we received the link where we looked at 250 patients, but we end up with 241 patients. We enrolled into the study. It was multi-institutional. We had two sites in Europe looking at 241 patients and getting blood tests done almost on a weekly basis and later on every two weeks and looking at T-SPAR response to CMV in vitro and see if this will predict patients who are going to have CMV reactivation. As you see here, 29% actually reactivated, had clinically significant CMV infection, 71 did not. So how this assay performed in this population, how was he a good predictor or not? And the sensitivity of this early spot assay actually was 94% as a predictor of clinically significant CMV infection. Depending on the color that we use, 94 to 96%. But what's important, the negative predictive value was high, meaning that if you have high response or what we call cellular mediated immunity to CMV, you're not going to have CMV reactivation if patient is not on high dose steroids. So this is something to keep in mind as negative predictive value. So in this cohort, we compared all-cause mortality in patients who had CMV reactivation versus the patient who did not, and we saw difference in all-cause mortality. The patient who had CMV reactivation, they had lower survival probability versus the one who did not. What's more interesting, actually, is that patient who had clinically significant CMV infection and had low CMI or cellular immediate immunity for CMV, they had the worst outcome or the worst survival when you compare to the other groups. So this is interesting. So is it really CMV or this is both the CMV and the immune system, the CMI that can predict or cause mortality in this patient? So that's what we show. I'm going to say one word about the other study that we did, and we are all faced this on the bad side of patient. We have all this low-level reactivation. Could be in high-risk versus low-risk patient. What to do about it? So it depends on your institution. Are you aggressive enough to start treatment, or you want to wait until you see increase, higher increase in viral load? Everyone do it a little bit differently. So this assay help us to determine which patient need to be treated. We did this kind of proof of concept in 55 patients. And we found that looking at cellular mediated immunity by using the ELISPOT assay, it can predict who will progress to CMV reactivation or to clinically significant CMV reactivation versus the one with high response where, to CMI where they did not progress in most of the cases. And most of these patients will progress on high dose steroids. So stay tuned for the CMV immunoassays. I think in SOT, they have also good data on that, but it could be used. I think we can figure out where these assay will be helpful, maybe at stop of prophylaxis, maybe at stop of treatment, could be for low reactivation, or in general, which patient will be at risk. And hopefully, maybe even patient after the 100 could be at risk for reactivation or not. So this patient, unfortunately, she was admitted on day plus 140 with short of breath, dry cough, hypoxemia. She had high viral load in the blood as well and the BL. And even though with IV gain cyclovir, she did not respond well, and she died with respiratory failure and other multi-organ failure. As you know, this has triggered other complications as well. So from the get-go, we could tell the patient not going to do well with the GIGVG as well as the CMV reactivation. So in retrospect, what would you have done differently in this patient? Would you have started initial therapy with foscarnet, or would you have continued prophylaxis with turmovir at day plus 100? Would you switch it to cytovir? I don't think anyone will do that. Or maybe you close monitor semi-viral on a weekly basis. 
Probably I would have done that, but also, what about extending the term of year to above the 100? Because we know the space is still at risk. And I get this question all the time. Can we do that? Do we need to do that? Although there's lack of data yet, there's ongoing phase three trial looking at extending the perfection to the 200. But for now, I know in some sense we may do it in our patient because we know they're still at risk for CIMV. Maybe we should extend that. But hopefully we get some good data soon from the phase three trial in the near future. This will change the way also of approaching late CIMV disease. So this is my talk. And in conclusion, we know serostatus is so important, define the risk for CMV, but other risk factors, and this dynamic, it may change over time. Immunoassay, hopefully we'll have good use of it after we validate some of this assay available, and if it become commercially available, it will be important. But novel antiviral, we're excited about it. There's few, one approved already, but there's few in the making. Hopefully this will change the way of preventing, but also treating CMV. Okay. Well, good afternoon. We heard a lot of science today. For the next 20 minutes, I invite you to come with me to the bedside. Before we see where we are, let's see where we started from. 2020 is an exciting time for CMV. In the 80s, we started from having CMV as a major cause of death in the first 100 days after transplant. In the 90s, we tried to prevent CMV and organ disease with preemptive therapy. In the decade of 2000, we were very focused to prevent viral load. We demonstrated that viral load was bad, and that actually spurred research to give us powerful tools, alternative medications, safer medications, that finally we can break the bond between the bad effects of CMV infection and treatment-related toxicities. And this is where we are now. We continue to improve patients' life, we continue to improve their quality of life, and hopefully we can improve survival. But we need also to optimize. We need to give the right drug to the right patient at the right time. So this is what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to look briefly at our real-world experience with latermovir prophylaxis, show the new options for CMV treatment, and present some cases that happened after implementing latermovir prophylaxis. We heard that latermovir was very effective in the clinical trial. A clinical trial is a controlled experiment, and taking the results to the real world requires a leap of faith, because real world is about human behavior. Over the last one, two years, many single-center studies demonstrated that latermovir is effective for prophylaxis. I'm going to focus in one center, which is my center in New York. This is our curve, the rates of CMV before latermovir prophylaxis, and the orange line is after latermovir prophylaxis. You can see that in low-risk patients, which is the much-related donor transplants, after latermovir prophylaxis, the first 100 days, rates of reactivation is 0%. Uh, this is when we start at about discharge, and we start with negative CMV-PCR. In the high-risk patients, 60% of them are ex vivo t cell depleted transplant patients, 74% CMV, clinically significant CMV defection before latermovir, 9% after latermovir. Note that you don't have the hump here. Everything, the lines are very flat because the timeline is cut at 100 days. So we didn't extend beyond the 100 days. So all these lines are very exciting and very good, but let's see what really translates to patients because the patients don't look at the lines, but the patients look at when they go home, when they don't need to be coming to clinic to receive IV medications or to be hooked to a pump at home. And this is what happened. The tall lines are our antiviral days before latermovir prophylaxis, so during the year of 2017, approximately 100 patients, and the lower bars, the blue, are the bars after latermovir prophylaxis. You can see overall a 90% increase in antiviral days for the first 100 days after transplant. The same applied for valgancyclovir alone or for scarnet alone. Nonetheless, there are some patients that received foscarnet, and I'm going to take you with me to the bedside to see some of these patients. 
This is actually a case that would not have qualified for latermovir prophylaxis. This is a 73-year-old man with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in partial remission. He is CMV recipient seronegative but donor positive. He has a history of malignant pleural effusion and portal hypertension with some associated edema. He received a much unrelated donor transplant with cyclophosphamide, fludarabine, and TBI, and he received post-transplant cyclophosphamide for GVSD prophylaxis. On day 56, viral load is 800 units per ml. His white count is 3.5. He has intermittent neutropenia. On this day, ANC is 1.7, but normally it ranges from 0.8 to 1.7. Renal function is as you see. What would you do now? Continue monitoring CMV, start latermovir, start gancyclovir, start foscarnet, start maribavir. A couple of years ago, we had only two options, but now we have more. We started foscarnet induction dose. On day 72, viral load was down, less than 136. Creatinine had more than doubled, was 2.4. The patient had significant edema, and he remains pancytopenic. What would you do next? You are called to recommend a regimen for discharge. Any takers for stop all antivirals? Stop all antivirals? Switch to foscarnet but maintenance dose? Check CMV immune responses? Stop foscarnet, start latermovir? And stop foscarnet, start vanilcyclovir? So we took the approach of stop foscarnet, start latermovir for secondary prophylaxis. Creatinine gradually improved. Patient continued to have persistent pleural effusion and ascites. He required catheter to drain the effusion and a takeoff catheter to drain the ascites periodically. However, he improved in other aspects. Creatinine improved and he was able to ambulate and CMV remains negative on latermovir. So this was a case that required foscarnet up front, and I wanted to talk to you about an alternative. Maribavir is now in late stage development for treatment of CMV. Maribavir is in a way similar to latermovir because it's a CMV specific drug, and therefore it doesn't have the toxicities of the nucleoside or nucleotide analogs. It has a different mechanism of action. It acts later in the viral cycle. It inhibits the UL97 kinase, which is essential for viral maturation and capsidation and the exit of the virions from the nucleus to the cytoplasm. It's an orally bioavailable drug. It exists only as a pill at this time, and it's not associated with myelotoxicity or nephrotoxicity. Importantly, maribavir is active against strains that are resistant to gancyclovir and or foscarnet. Now, maribavir was evaluated for preemptive therapy in a phase two study, which included stem cell transplants and solid organ transplants with CMV viremia, but no CMV and organ disease. Patients were randomized to one of three doses of maribavir versus valgancyclovir. Patients were aware if they were taking valgancyclovir or maribavir, but they were blinded to the dose of maribavir. The primary endpoint was clearance of viremia at six weeks. And this is what you need to know, that all doses of maribavir performed as well as valgancyclovir in clearing viremia at six weeks. And again, this is the same. Importantly, they were the most important treatment emergent adverse event for maribavir was GI related and most common was taste disturbance, while the most common side effect for valgancyclovir was neutropenia. So what do we have to take home? At this point, at least for clearance of viremia, we don't know about any indirect effects, but at least for clearance of viremia, maribavir was as good as valgancyclovir with no new safety concerns. We will move to case two. This is a 37-year-old man with acute myeloid leukemia in first complete remission. He is CMV recipient positive, received much related donor transplant, and he received ex vivo T cell depletion for GVHD prophylaxis. 
Normally at our institution, we check CMVPCR on day seven to make sure that it's negative and then this type of patients start Letermovir prophylaxis. This particular patient had the CMV viral load of 7,000. At the same time, he had E. coli sepsis. He was transferred to the ICU. He was pancytopenic and had good creatinine. He was started on induction for Scarnet. CMV responded. On day 13, he engrafted. On day 26, viral load is undetectable. After three weeks on for Scarnet, he now has good counts and good creatinine. Now you are called to give recommendations on discharge. What would you do? Stop all antivirals, switch to valgancyclovir maintenance, start letermovir secondary prophylaxis, or do something else. So we gave again letermovir secondary prophylaxis. Of course, remember that you need to have a cyclovir on board when you start letermovir, and viral load remains undetectable. And I want to share this new publication. It came up about, I guess, a couple of weeks ago. It's the French experience with Letermovir for secondary prophylaxis. The French had actually access to Marie Barrier as to Letermovir for compassionate use. And they present 80 consecutive stem cell transplants where Letermovir was given late after transplant, median 170 days. Many of these patients were heavily pretreated. They had CMV disease. They were on steroids, and they showed that the drug was very well tolerated, and only four out of 80 patients developed CMV recurrence during Letermovir secondary prophylaxis. So based on this relatively limited data and anecdotal experience, at this point, we believe that Letermovir is a very viable option for secondary prophylaxis. This is the third case. A 59-year-old man with acute myelogenous leukemia in first complete remission. He was CMV recipient positive, donor negative, received matched and related donor transplant with conditioning of busulfan, melphalan, fludarabin, and ATG. He received ex vivo T cell depletion for GVHD prophylaxis. On day seven, viral load is undetectable. He started letermovir prophylaxis per protocol. On day 40, he started having some upper GI symptoms consistent with JVHD. Budesonide was added. Day 100, viral load was undetectable. Letermovir was discontinued. The patient has persistent GI complaints and he starts on prednisone 20 milligrams per day. On day 130, you are called because CMV is now 300 units per ml. How many would repeat CMV PCR in a few days? Start Letermovir prophylaxis, start Valgancyclovir, start Valgancyclovir and put him back on Letermovir, and do something else. Okay, I have to ask Roy. Either one or two, I would say. Continue the term of year or, you know, or you can repeat the viral load, making sure the patient is still at high risk for reactivation. The patient had discontinued Letermovir, so at this point we continued to monitor. We were concerned that the CMVPCR would be on the rise and we didn't want to use Letermovir. On day 130, he has worsening diarrhea. Now colonoscopy shows GVHD and he started on prednisone one milligram per kilogram. On day 140, CMV is repeated and CMV now is 500. Valgancyclovir is started. And after 14 days of valgancyclovir, CMV remains 3,000. You are called to do something. What are you thinking of doing? We are called here in these situations all the time. And frankly, I think this particular patient, 14 days in our experience, is actually a short time for him to respond. And my sense is that probably if you continue valgancyclovir longer, the patient will respond. He has not been exposed to valgancyclovir previously. 
However, you know, there are some concerns with concomitant treatment for GVHD for cytopenia. So the patient qualified for what we define as refractory CMV. So he was enrolled in the Maribavir study for resistant refractory CMV, and he was randomized to the Maribavir arm. Of course, when we checked for CMV resistance, there was no mutation identified. He completed eight weeks of Maribavir without a problem. At the same time, he was started on alpha-1 antithrypsin for control of his GVHD. And after he completed with Maribavir, he was placed on Letermovir secondary prophylaxis. And he's doing well. And this is the Maribavir for the refractory or resistant CMV infection, the phase two trial. Again, it included stem cell and solid organ transplants. So patients were randomized to one of three doses of Maribavir and they were blinded as to the Maribavir dose. They could take Maribavir up to 24 weeks. However, the end point was clearance of viremia at six weeks. And two-thirds of the patients, you can focus on the highlighted right-sided column, 66% of patients at week six had undetectable, which was 200 copies, viral load with Maribavir. Many of those patients were heavily pretreated patients with documented resistance and or end organ disease. So this is actually an encouraging result for this population. About a third of the patients had a recurrence of viremia while on Maribavir. Again, many of these patients have persistent immune defect. And in some of the cases of recurrence on drug, Maribavir resistance was documented. I want also to point out Maribavir does not cross the brain-blood barrier and so should not be used if there is a concern for CMV encephalitis. And also beware that if the patient develops symptoms of encephalopathy, encephalitis while on Maribavir, be very proactive to check for CMV involvement. Now, what about Letermovir? Can we use Letermovir as salvage? So the data is not there. We have so far case series, heterogeneous patients with mixed responses. Many of these case series report initial response, but eventually recurrence of CMV with resistance. So at this point, I would caution you not to use Letermovir as salvage unless it is in the context of a trial or there is really no other alternative. Dr. Marty is doing a phase two study for Letermovir as treatment at the Dana-Farber. What about combination? So we had two drugs, now we are having three and potentially four. We don't really know. This is a good field to look into as we get our hands in these drugs. This is just in vitro combinations where what we see is Maribavir and Letermovir are additive. Maribavir and Gansaclovir, at least in vitro, are very antagonistic, and Maribavir with serolimus is synergistic. And actually, Maribavir acts better in cells that are not dividing very well. So that remains to be seen. This is a 46-year-old woman with acute myeloid leukemia, CMV IgG positive, donor positive. She got a mismatched transplant and got T-cell depletion for GVSD prophylaxis. On day 11, her CMV viral load was less than 137. Letermovir prophylaxis was started. However, on day 16, the viral load was 500 copies. She stopped Letermovir and was treated with Valgancyclovir for two weeks. After two weeks, Viral load was again undetectable. She was neutropenic and Letermovir was resumed. And she did well until week 16 when the CMV viral load was noted to be 2000 on routine screening. She has no other symptoms. At this time, who is concerned about Letermovir resistance? I would not be concerned about resistance to anything else at this point because she only has seen Letermovir. Indeed, the genotype show Letermovir resistance at this UL56 gene, the position 325, that gives high level resistance to Letermovir. Letermovir was discontinued. Valgancyclovir was started for two weeks. Similarly to our other patient, after two weeks, there is one less than one log reduction in viral load. Again, this is a typical situation in the T-cell depleted patients. 
However, due to concerns for neutropenia and due to the fact that she qualified for refractory CMV, she was enrolled in the Maribavir trial. She was randomized to Maribavir. She took Maribavir and felt that the pills taste bad. She actually said that this is not an altered taste. It's just a problem with the pills. The pills taste very bad. And viral load promptly came down. And after eight weeks of Maribavir, she was completely discontinued of any antivirals at about week 28. Later, at week 35, she had an episode of viremia. Maximum viral load was 800 copies, and she was observed without treatment, and viremia resolved spontaneously, and she's remained well, and she's now more than one and a half years after transplant. So I hope we have conveyed that we have now safer options for CMV prevention and hopefully soon for treatment. And for the first time in the CMV history, we have the ability to separate the effects of CMV from the effects of the treatment. And that gives us the power to explore. We need to understand what is the impact of CMV infection of on immune reconstitution. We know that CMV viremia shapes the repertoire of the T cells, not only for CMV, but for other infections. We are in a situation where we have CMV only specific drugs. We don't know what impact that will have on other viruses, other DNA viruses, such as HSV6. As an optimist, we may say that by preventing CMV, we may improve immunity and we may have less of those, but who knows? And so we need to connect the dots. And more importantly, we have an unfinished business. We have to see if we can finally bridge the gap of survival between the CMV seropositive and CMV seronegative recipients. I have a question on the card. The first one is about leturmovir. Is it good for preventing CMV infection in solid organ transplant? I would say stay tuned. There is ongoing phase three trial in kidney transplant recipient. And I'm not sure when the data will be released, but at least this will be looking at prevention in solid organ transplant. Do you want to comment about the role of cell therapy with CMV cytotoxic T cells? Yeah, we didn't have time to touch up on that, but it's a great question. I think so far with data, that most of the data that we have on the CMV specific T cell infusion is usually for refractory or resistant, and I think it has a role in that area. There is minimal data on prophylaxis. I don't know if it is really a winning proposition to use it for prevention, but for treatment of heart CMV disease versus refractory it could have a role in that, but still, I think some ongoing trials to show the benefit. Uh, I agree, and I'll have to say that we know that CMV cell therapy is safe. We know that it has demonstrated feasibility, and we are very much looking forward to randomized control trials. We believe that this is a complementary approach, and it is very important for the right patient at the right time. I have one question also from the floor about if you're using leturmovir for secondary prophylaxis, for how long? I would say as long as it's needed when patients still at risk for reactivation. I don't think there's an answer to that. And hopefully, as I mentioned later, we're going to have probably more data published on that, and we maybe learn more on the efficacy. But it's not indicated yet. There's no phase three trial that look at secondary prophylaxis. So thank you all for attending today's symposium. Thank you. This activity has been jointly provided by the Medical College of Wisconsin and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash ZXF860. This educational activity is supported by independent medical education grants from Merck & Company Incorporated and Shire.